Philippians, time for some joy. This is a book that, uh, uh, if you're uh, kind of a kind of a churched person and have gone to Bible college or something like that, you'll have heard that this book is called the Joy Book. Uh, because it mentions joy, I think like 14 times or 17 times, which is a lot for four chapters. But it mentions Jesus Christ over 40 times. So, uh, this book is actually a book on Jesus. And what I'd like to do today is do a short, short recap on uh, last week. Um, I'm really hoping this sucker works. Oh, yes. All right. Good. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> that was his mother saying that. All right. This book, Christ as the Believer's Life. I, I got to put this out there because uh, uh, often we, we are used to this idea that we've invited Jesus into our life. Or that we were so generous because we're such wonderful people that we gave him our heart. Aren't we nice? You're not following me, are you? Okay. You never gave your heart to Jesus. He already had it. Okay? Our heart's the thing that boom, 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 and, and, and kind of pumps blood through, and we call the heart our, the seat of our emotions. Um, but this is something even better. Sometimes uh, we've been taught that we have life independent from God. Well, we don't. I believe, from everything I've seen in Scripture, there is no life apart from Jesus Christ. He is life. He is eternal life. Not that you have eternal life. He is eternal life. So Christ, as the believer's life, the beauty of the believer is they get to experience it. That is the good news. Jesus is your life. He's not just in it. He is the essence. You and He are one. You're merged. You're in union with Him. So if we look at a, um, a thing like joy... We can say, oh, we got to have more joy. No, you don't need more joy. Recognize the joy that is in you. And you get to experience joy when your mind is thinking the thoughts of God through it. Remember, you have the mind of Christ. You possess the mind. It's in you. If his life is in you, he can think his thoughts through you. If he wants to live his life through you, he can think his thoughts through you. So this book of joy... Jesus, your real life, is the source of your joy. I call him the series source code. I've got to find a cool picture to go back behind or something like that. But if we can understand our source code, that Jesus is our DNA for all spiritual things, all spiritual fruit, all spiritual life, all spiritual experience, Jesus is the source. So, when people say the prayer, it's not a bad thing. They're only affirming what has already happened. You can't say the prayer without the work having been done. It's impossible. Your, pr your words aren't powerful enough to get God to create something like that. He's already made you new. He's given you His life. He's finished the work of the cross for humanity. He has given us joy. And sometimes we get to experience that joy. It looks like happiness sometimes. Thank goodness nobody's in the front row. Uh, sometimes it looks like happiness. But authentic joy is not based on your circumstances. I've spoken to enough people this week. They're not experiencing happiness in their circumstances. Because it's really crappy. You know, there's a family here today dealing with grief. From loss. Somebody else. Loss of job. Other people. Loss of relationships. Spousal, children. Oh, you wouldn't believe what's happening here. <laughs> this is life going on on earth. In those circumstances, you can still have joy. Happiness is based on your happenings. But joy is based on your, the presence of God in you and your oneness with Him. There's a big difference. So, this book... The source, 
and talks about purpose. Well, we all have a purpose in life. We need to understand our purpose in life. Well, let me just say this for the short answer. Jesus Christ is your purpose. Churchianity has messed us up. It has told us, okay, that's nice that he's your purpose, but there's more he wants you to do. So the doing becomes the new purpose. And when your focus is on all the doing, thinking that that is what you have to do to please God, your eyes are not on Christ. It's on the doing. I know when I first discovered God's grace, uh, I had this pendulum shift. Moving from doing much to try and please God to, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> Forget it. You know, I don't, oh, I don't have to tithe? Good, I'm not going <laughs> to. I don't have to pray? <laughs> Wonderful, I'm not going to pray. <laughs> See, I'm experiencing grace. <laughs> Anybody ever experienced that? Okay. <laughs> that was a pastor at the time. <laughs> God has shown me that was just the beginning. I was so worked up in performance. And yet, somehow, God's grace was kind of working through me anyway. There's some stuff I didn't buy into. I wasn't a hardcore legalist. I had a lot of grace in there, but I didn't recognize it. And yet, God just took it and went, I'll take care of this. Your mind's going to start being renewed right now. It's my job to renew your mind. I'm going to draw your attention to the things I want you to see, and I'm going to give you the capacity to believe true truth. It's all up to Jesus. And all of us are on the same path. Your purpose is a person named Jesus. At the end of the message today, there's a verse we're going to look at, just, just for a second, um, that will kind of give you an interesting perspective on the will of God for you. In Philippians, as we started to look through this book, um, Paul prays. And last week we talked a little bit about uh, who does he pray for, and when does he pray, how does he pray. Well, today I want to talk about the why and the what. Whom did he pray, or for whom did he pray? He was praying for the church leaders, for the church family. He actually names the pastors and deacons, saying this role is a role that must be recognized and respected. And God's using those leaders to do his work in that church. Because their job is to, listen to this, build and equip the saints to do the work. Isn't that great? All of us will be involved. There will be doing. But don't you, you don't begin with doing. You begin with believing. Those who just love sitting in belief, belief, oh, this is wonderful, this is the gospel, praise the oh, wonderful, praise the Lord. Yeah, what, what do you, you know, and not responding to it through action are immature. Are not growing up. Just saying. <laughs> That's what scripture says. <laughs> you know? And so you can, you can sit in your pew, which we don't have here, um, and uh, that way we don't have to be pew sitters. Um, uh, you can sit and enjoy good stuff, but you are called to action. There are times where you're going to sit and have to take in. You're going to have to sit and heal. And some have been here for a couple of years and are still healing, and that is their process. There is no rush. There isn't a, oh, look at them, I've got to catch up to where they are spiritually. <laughs> no. Your journey is your journey. And don't project your path onto the person sitting beside you. They have their own path. And Papa is well aware of their journey. And is already intricately involved in them. So Paul's praying for the pastors, for the deacons, for the Christians in Philippi. That's who. When? He said, every time I think of you, and God brought them to his mind often, which last week we talked about briefly, that that is the initiation of prayer. God bringing it to your mind. Of a funny feeling, all of us can learn something about slowing down and taking silent time with God, which I would have said a couple years ago, oh, that's more doing. Oh, that's becoming legalistic. Now you're telling people what to do. Yeah, some people need some direction. And some people on the front end, children, need some discipline, guidance, so that they can become listeners to the voice of God and then obey it. But there is some discipling, disciplining that goes along with it. And all of us are in that package. Why does he pray? Because this is a group of people that have invested in him, in the ministry he's done. 
Those who receive his teaching gave to him. That's how they, because his job was teaching. They gave. And they were crazy givers. It was insane how generous they were. They were so passionate about what he was teaching and what he was doing. And God put it in them to live out of the generosity that was already in them. All of us have generosity within us. Every single one. Uh, last week we saw the generosity of Christ through a young boy. Dom. It was through Dom, an initiation to bless Jen. You know, through a little boy. Lori reminded me when, when I got home, uh, I said, there is somebody, that, that, there is a kid doing this. Yeah, you're right. That was cool. Experiencing the life of Christ at any age. Never too old, never too young. All right? It's really cool. Listen to this. In Philippians 1 verse 5. Oh, it is there. Good. It says here, In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. This word participation and fellowship. And the word fellowship, the Greek word is koinonia. You heard that word a lot. Uh, the word koinonia here has something more powerfully involved than you can imagine. You may not have realized this, but when we are fellowshipping, I'm going to show you three things that are happening and should be happening. If they're not, it's not authentic fellowship, I don't think. Here it is. The first one. Spiritual communication. I'm not going to write any of these down up there. But when we're fellowshipping, something has happened between you and Papa already. There is a spiritual communication going on. Oh, and remember, we're one with Him. We're in union with Jesus Christ, right? So we're fellowshipping with Him. We're also one with one another. Look how many other people around you are one with Him. That means you're melted in with them too. <laughs> oh, we're close to them. <laughs> yes, you are. And that's God's gift to you. Because it's not about you. It's about Him. It's about him and the oneness you have with him. And you get to experience it. He's invited you into him. He's brought you in. And you get to experience that. So there's a spiritual connection, sharing of Christ. And coming together here, we get to share some of that stuff. And it comes in different packages. Different people speaking, different people sharing, different ways. You got Sunday school teachers, you got worship, you got Maggie on coffee. <laughs> you know, like, like those are really important gifts, you know, but we're sharing together. That's called koinonia. Secondly, we have a sympathetic cooperation, which means we work together for Christ. Not for Him, as in getting Him to like us, but He is our author, our motive, He is the, the strength, He is it all for Christ in that sense. So when we serve together, it's a cooperation that comes from Christ. Whether we're studying the Word of God together, or whether we're singing together, or having a spiritual conversation. Unfortunately, the, that is an area we all can grow in, is our spiritual conversations. Um, sometimes our, our conversations reflect nothing of a spiritual thing. Well, it's, it was never sourced in Christ. So, And there are other things that may not sound like they're... Uh, spiritual, but God gave it to you to talk with to somebody about. Like a common uh, idea. Uh, example, we're going to be starting small groups in the fall. And some of the focus groups could be dealing with a, a hobby. Car repair guys. or a, you know, Some guys like going to see movies, so you have your movie group. <laughs> hey, why not? And then you have your um, whatever. Like, uh, it doesn't matter. Are, we're figuring out who and what is joining us together. And sometimes those common interests bring us together to talk about things. Those are just layers to bring us to even deeper fellowship and deeper conversation with each other. Not everybody's wired for running to all these things, but perhaps Papa may draw you into a group. He may draw you in to put yourself at risk because He has something in you He wants to give others. could be scary, but it's not about you. And then thirdly, we have sweet communion. It makes us partners with Christ. It's the fellowship with Christ that we have. The participation. Alright, what does he pray? He prays for four things. I'll just read them to you now and then uh, we'll, we're going to take a look at them because they're really cool. First he prays in verse 6 that God's word will be carried to its completion. He says, for I'm confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it 
until the day of Jesus Christ. Then, in verse 9, he says that you'll be, he prays that they'll be filled with love. In verse 10, that they might have the spirit of discernment, be able to sort things out spiritually. That they'll be, in verse 11, that they'll be filled with the fruits of righteousness. There's a lot going on in this first chunk. I don't, I'm not going to go this slowly for the rest of the book, but this, this part really, really is important. Especially when we're just digging into it. I hope you took time to read Philippians this week. A uh, very easy read. If you didn't, try it. Go for it. Give it a read through. You'll, you'll benefit from it. So, in verse 6, Paul says, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Has Christ begun a work in you? Yes or no? Then... He will see it through to completion. It's not up to you. If you, can, if you end up saying no, then you're blind to the reality that He has begun a good work in you. It started at the cross, and there's nothing you can do about it. He did it for you, in you, and through you. Sorry. He loves you. <laughs> you can't get away from Him. He's nuts about you. The word here being confident. Since I am confident of this very thing. The idea of he'll perform it. The word perform means to carry it through to completion. How many have ever been caught on a roller coaster when it did not complete the cycle? You have? Jim? Really? Really? Or, uh, which part? The top? Or were you hanging? You're looking for a juicy story. Come on. <laughs> You can imagine, you know, that, that if the roller coaster doesn't complete, you're stuck there. And that's not a good thing. That's when you really hope your seatbelt's on. So, the Holy Spirit will not be a failure. He will see you through completion. Even though there are ups and downs in life. Um, those do not deter from, listen to this, the truth of who you are in Christ. That's where we live from. That's where we um, have our base the source code of all of our thoughts and attitudes, which again are planted by Christ. It's beautiful. Verse 7. This is a, a slight rabbit trail, but really good. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart. Since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Can you say that you have people in your heart? You have their best interests here? You hear a story, your heart leaps out for them. It doesn't have to all just be here. But you have relatives, you have people you know, people that God's placed in your life. It's an affectionate term. It means there's a closeness. If it's just Buddy driving down the street and... Uh, um, you know, they, they have a um, casual car accident and nobody's hurt, nothing. You go, oh well, sucks to be you. And off you go. You know, right? If you don't know them. But they get out of the car and you go, <gasps> Bob! Boom, you're over there. <laughs> you have a connection. Connections matter. Relationships matter. You are not wired for solitude, although some personalities handle more solitude better than others. But nobody... As far as the gospel is concerned, especially when you see the word koinonia, we are not wired. Our, our new DNA is not wired for aloneness. That's where my personality is. No, you need to look at your nature, not your personality. Your, your nature is the source code. Your personality is how you're wired in your soul. Okay? And some are, have good personalities, some people have bad. And, just kidding. <laughs> Some will clash and, you know. <laughs> it's worth studying personalities because most of the problems you have between people are personality clashes, not real problems. Communication and teachability. So he says, I got you in my heart. You're partakers of grace. And again, this is the, the word fellowship, the koinonia. Um, it's all wrapped up together. He's saying to the saints that you are wrapped up with me in this good news we're doing. Even though I'm in jail, you're with me in this. You're participating in my pain. You're participating when I have joy. I'm sharing with you the joy of the good news. 
You know, it's great having a praise time. And sometimes we have people that share prayer requests and things are, are heavy and we pray for them. But when we share testimony, evidence, and story of God at work actively in our lives, it is an encouragement to us. We don't do enough of that here, I don't think. I know we're not charismatic. So what? We are charisma. We are Christ filled, spirit filled, spirit led. And some people can look like this, and some can look just like this. You can't tell the difference, but inside is spirit. One spirit. And you're one with that spirit. It's really cool. So he goes on to say in verse 8. I love this part. This, this, this was, I, when I saw this, I went, oh boy, this is heavy for some, it could be heavy for some of us. He says, for God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ. I'd like to hear another translation. If you have your Bibles with you, um, tell me the translation you have and stand up and read verse 8. I'm looking for a word that's not common. Who's got King James? Anybody? All right. Read it really loud from where you are. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you, all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Great. <laughs> I like to be remembered and wanted in my bowels. <laughs> okay? Anyone else? That was the word I was looking for. That is the word I'm looking for. <laughs> what else you got? You living. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. Mm. Same verse. Jesus knows the drawing compassion and hunger in the bowels. That's the, right, that's the correct translation, by the way. The word bowels. It's this place in the center of who you are. The emotions. There are even some cultures that, you know how in our Western culture we say we invite Jesus into our heart. They say they invite them either into throat, and I've heard stomach. Not, not hard. So it's an imagery, okay? Well, there's something to say about the, uh, about the bowels. I want to read this. A psychologist from the University of Southern California said, The ancients were right. They were accurate when they talked about our feelings being in the region of the bowels. He said, the average person thinks that everything he does is because he has thought it over and that he is very smart. Huh. Pointing to the head, he says, very little takes place up here. <laughs> Oops. He went on to explain that the brain is really a very marvelous telephone exchange. A message comes up through the sensory nervous system, up through a synaptic connection from the hand to the brain. Immediately there is a transfer made over to a motor neuron and the message goes down over a different set of synaptic connections. For example, when you touch a hot stove, immediately the message goes to the brain. The brain returns the message saying, take your finger off that, you'll get burned! And you react instantly. You do it without thinking. But there was a connection made up in the brain. Then he asks his friend, how, do you feel, how did you feel the first time you saw your wife? Where did that take place? Was it in the brain? The psychologist points to his tummy and says, there is where you live and move and have your being. So Paul is expressing his most tender feelings. He says, I long after you. It's not because they had given him something. His reaction is not mental, but emotional. It's in a wonderful expression. Here's the connection I saw with this. We have a culture that is sick physically. Most of it's in the stomach. There are many people who have many gut issues, stress-related issues. I remember when my wife and I, uh, early on in ministry, in the first couple of years, we had some, let's say, church crap hit us, Christian rules and procedures. Remember? All right. And so it was stressful. <laughs> it was really stressful. And so we bore through it, whatever, didn't realize it was being knotted up in our bellies. We couldn't figure out what was going on. I couldn't figure out what was going on. I'd take medicines and Tums and all kinds of stuff, not knowing the tensions were here. And it happened many months after the event. 
your stomach carries much stress. A.B. Simpson understood this. He had many issues related to stress and bowels. And God showed him something powerful. And this is why the message of grace to me is so critical. When we discover who our life is, the energy used to try and get God to like us, the energy we use to try and get God to make us more acceptable, the energy we use to try and get forgiven when we already are, all that energy, if those are lies, which they are, then we have unnecessary stress going on. Energy being used for something that was never meant to be used. And when we discover we are loved, are valued, that we are already forgiven, that we are one with Him, and He's crazy about us, we can rest in the fact He's got it. We can take a deep breath and go, wow. And watch those things unwind. And watch not only you soften and rest in Him, physically, your body will begin to heal itself. I think there's far more stress-related illnesses out there than you can possibly imagine. In the bowels. And he's talking about this, and that's why I pulled that word out of King James, because you don't hear about it these days. Um, but Paul here says, thinking of those who he loved, he just had it all here. He used that word as deep and intimate. Do you have that intimacy with Christ? Do you believe He is for you? Can you rest in Him? Or do you stress like crazy? Sometimes we think a little bit of worry doesn't hurt us and it just shows people that we're wise and, you know, that we're, you know, we're handling things, you know, we're not being stupid. <laughs> but do we rest? Do we trust? Or do we carry our worry right here? Let God talk to you about that one. Because that, that's starting to head out of uh, a, a medical health issue that I am not qualified to deal with. But I've seen enough evidence of it to at least draw your attention to it. Listen to this. Oswald Chambers, July 4th. One of God's great don'ts. Do not fret. It only causes harm. Psalm 37, 8. Fretting means getting ourselves out of joint, mentally or spiritually. It is one thing to say, do not fret, but something very different to have such a nature that you find yourself unable to fret. It's easy to say, rest in the Lord and be patient with Him, for Him. Psalm 37, 7. Until our own little world is turned upside down and we are forced to live in confusion and agony like so many other people. It is possible to rest in the Lord. Is it? Yes, it is. If this do not doesn't work there, then it will not work anywhere. This do not fret must work during our days of difficulty and uncertainty as well as our peaceful days or it will never work. If it will not work in your particular case, it will not work for anyone else. Resting in the Lord is not dependent on your external circumstances at all, but on your relationship with God himself. Worrying always results in sin. The word sin means to miss the mark. Alright? Always misses the mark when we worry. We tend to think that a little anxiety and worry are simply an indication of how wise we really are. Yet, it is actually a much better indication of just how we are living after the flesh. <laughs> Fretting rises from our determination to have our own way. Us controlling how we want the end result to come out. Our Lord never worried and was never anxious because His purpose was never to accomplish His own plan, but to fulfill God's. Have you been propping up that foolish soul of yours with the idea that your circumstances are too much for God to handle? Set all your opinions and speculations aside and abide under the shadow of the Almighty, Psalm 91.1. Deliberately tell God that you will not fret about whatever concerns you. All our fretting and worrying is caused by planning without God. Well, you can tell God, but trust that it's God in you telling you to tell Him that. All you're doing is referring back to Him, truth. 
We do take on a lot ourselves, don't we? Paul deals with stress. He talks about joy. He talks about the power of God in every circumstance. I believe it's in Corinthians where he, he says, Look, I've just gone through all this stuff. I felt like I had a sentence of death on me. Oh no, I'm in trouble. I was, thought I was going to die. And the point was, So that I would not depend on myself, but on Christ, who is my strength and my life. It's powerful. So, what he's praying. He prays something else. And he says, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. He's praying that they'll grow up. He says, Let your love abound. If you have some love today, Paul is saying to you, Grow more in it. You've not arrived. There is no arrival. Yeah, but it's in my comfort zone. You know, I've I, I got just this much time and, and this much love to give away. He's saying, that's not enough. Because you've been given overflowing love. It's not your love anyway. It's His. And it's not for you to keep. All the love that He gives you is for you to give away. Every, listen to this. Everything God gives you. I'm not talking about material things necessarily. But there's an attitude here that everything He gives you is not for you. You may enjoy it for a time. He may give you, get you to give it away. But it's His. And if He can do that, He'll take care of every need anyway. We have a weird economy in our Western world. We think, uh, get and keep. Get and keep. Because I am controlling my, listen to this, security. I am securing my peace in times of trouble. It's very different. Scary. Well, he prays that their love will abound and that they'll grow. And then he says, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. Approve the whole idea of discernment. Who is your discernment? It's Christ. I've had people come into the church, new people. I haven't seen them again. But they give me their list of spiritual gifts. You know? Boom, boom, boom. This is, this. I have the gift of discernment. I've got the, oh, Really? Like, and they start dictating things to you. They're using spiritual leverage or churchianity words to try and get the rankings and so they can be involved in the church. Well, I'm starting to sniff through that pretty quick, and I think you guys can too. You know? There's nothing wrong with sharing your gifts, but when it's the first thing, like, how about relationship first? Let's just get to know each other. It's like guests when you come and, you, and some people say, hey, I like this church, I want to stay here. The first thing I'm going to tell you to do is get to know people. Enter relationship. Otherwise, you don't have a people to fellowship with. And if Sunday mornings is the only connection, then it'll be a very shallow time. If this is the only, this shouldn't be. It's what we got right now. This is how we deal with it in our, in our culture. But uh, this is not the be-all and end-all. And uh, you're seeing changes already happening at Hope Fellowship uh, to move us towards greater uh, ability to connect. And lastly, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Where else have you heard that word fruit of righteousness? Galatians 5. Listen to this. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, Peace, healing, get it? Peace, he'll calm us down. It's great, just showing you. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. So he's saying, hey, you've been filled with spirit. Has, don't put your hands up for this one, but I've, I've spent years calling my charismatic and Pentecostal pastor friends trying to figure out if I was filled or how to get filled. Because they have an edge more than the traditional background that I grew up with on, on the focus on spirit. The one I grew up with had more focus on Bible. Okay, like there's, Each tribe has a different perspective and they, they bring something to the body of Christ that we all need to learn. So don't point negatively at other tribes. It's not, it's not helpful to you because you're pointing at your brothers that you're one with. All right? But I called them and said, hey, uh, how can I know? And they, I never really got a great answer until I saw this and one other verse. 
when I found out I already had the Spirit, I went, yes, I knew it. <laughs> Who do you think told me? The Spirit told me. He's in me. And there's nothing I can change about that. Be encouraged. He will produce the fruit that needs to be produced through you. Usually we've turned this list into a, um, a to-do list. You must love. You must be patient. You must be kind. Even the First Corinthians says, love is patient, love is kind. Oh, i got to do all this stuff. It's like the marriage to-do list. That's impossible. That's not the marriage to-do list. It's evidence list of the Spirit of Christ in you. Period. So when you see it, you go, that was fruit of Christ. Cool. Love to see a few more fruit. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. All right. Lastly, oh darn, did I hit the wrong button? Oh, whew, good. Romans 12. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all He has done for you. And what did He do for you? Gave you life. Gave you everything. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind He will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship Him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Who does that? Let God transform you. Oh, it says be renewed, so i got to go and renew my mind. i got to do this. No, you don't. <laughs> It's God doing it. All you get to do is respond to His promptings. You go, i got a desire to do this. Good! Recognize, that's the desire of God in me. I want to obey that. I want to respond. If you're feeling guilty, oh, i got to do this, then pause and retrain your mind to think more accurately. It's God at work. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Jesus is good, Jesus is pleasing, and Jesus is perfect. Jesus is God's will for you. You don't have to look for a bullseye. Am I in the center of God's will? There never was a bullseye. He is the will of God for you. And your only work is to believe it. Isn't that cool? Yeah. All right, let's take up an offering. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> I'm kidding. Actually, we will, but <laughs> that's funny. All right, let's pray. Um, worship team, do you want to come up? Heavenly Father, uh, thanks for your goodness. Thanks for your gentleness. Thank you that you are the one actively in us initiating all growth and excitement and passion. Open our eyes to see your life in others that we may be supernaturally, which is the new natural, drawn to them, loving them with your love, so we may come to have an authentic love for everybody. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.